Graham Arnold has just announced his 25-man Australian squad for the upcoming World Cup qualifiers against Lebanon. And it is quite possibly one of the worst Socceroos sides I have ever seen. Hello guys, it's me, Alex from the Back 4 Podcast. And I didn't want to make this video really, but I thought I'd just upload a quick video explaining why the Australian national team is seemingly going backwards uh, since the World Cup campaign in 2022 and uh, why I think that this squad selection especially is indicative of the problems that are going on within the national team right now and uh, the risks that we run if this kind of shit continues. But uh, anyways guys, before the video starts, make sure you like and subscribe down below and uh, show some support on these videos that I'm making and let me know if you want to see more videos like this in the future. But with that being said, lads, let's get into the video. Also, apologies if I look half asleep in this video. I've just been up all night watching the Champions League as well as Bournemouth versus Luton. So, yes. Very tired. I look like shit. Understandable. I need a haircut. Save it. I don't give a shit. Let's just get into why I fucking hate this national team right now. Now, this video is going to be split up into three parts, and those are going to be me discussing the actual squad that we have against Lebanon, me demonstrating the negative downward trends that are uh, quite evident within the Socceroos setup right now, and uh, also what I think needs to be improved going forward regarding coaching, regarding selections, players, even stuff down to what can be done from the APL and Football Australia. So, yes, let's get into the first part of this video, which is our squad that we have against Lebanon. Now, while I understand that a lot of people on social media especially are not too concerned with this squad selection, uh, saying stuff like, lads, it's Lebanon, it's two games against them, we should get easy wins against them, I need to raise something. That is not the point, all right? Yes, we should be getting wins against nations like Lebanon, and yes, I'm confident that we will end up beating Lebanon on both occasions. However, why in God's name in a system where we play one striker, have we selected six? Six strikers going in to our two games against Lebanon. As well as that, we have selected zero natural right wingers. We have selected one left back, three right backs. Sorry, no, four right backs, one left back, who was playing left wing for us at the last Asian Cup campaign, as well as six strikers. I don't know what the hell is going on anymore. I don't know what Graham Arnold is trying to force through his thick head. But aside from that, what are some of these selections to the current squad? Now you may be wondering, Alex, who are you talking about in particular? Well, let's just go through the squads quickly and let's sort of just break down why I have certain problems with this squad. First off, let's go over the goalkeepers. Goalkeepers, I have no problem. The three goalkeepers selected were Matt Ryan, Joe Gauci, and Tom Glover. Obviously, I have no problems with this goalkeeper selection. Glover's been in good form recently for Middlesbrough as he was starting after their first team keeper got injured. Joe Gauchy's just secured a record move to Aston Villa, so he absolutely has to be in the squad. And Matt Ryan, obviously, you need the experienced goalkeeper there to help the young guys. Would I have preferred to see maybe someone like Bolokovic? Maybe. Maybe I would have liked to see Bolokovic get his chance. But overall, I'm happy with the goalkeepers. No complaints there. However, the defense is where I start getting a few just small inking problems, all right? First off, let's discuss the right-back situation. Why on God's green earth have we bought four right-backs? Four right-backs. And yes, two of those are Gethin Jones and Thomas Deng, who you can say, well, Alex, they're actually just centre-backs. Well, considering that neither of them were playing centre-back in the recent, what, two years that they've been involved in the national team? Sorry, that's for Thomas Deng. And Gethin Jones, the entirety of the time he's been with the national team, he's been right back. Alongside that, we've also selected Nathaniel Atkinson and Lewis Miller, who, yes, should be in the squad. But I, I just wonder why the hell we are bringing two further right backs into the squad. Along with that, the left back situation. Now, I'll go through quickly and announce that some of the players are not available. On top of that is Aziz Bayic, Marco Tilio, Martin Boyle. They're all unavailable for these fixtures. Fair enough, all right? So why have we only bought one left back, that being Jordi Boss, with the only left-footed center back being Cameron Burgess? There is no cover there if we were to experience an injury to Jordan Boss. Absolute zero cover. Why you don't just bring a Moragas or a Farrell along with them, just in case there is that small doubt or small injury 
in the case of Jordan Boss, I don't understand. Now, for centre-backs, obviously, I don't have a problem with that. You know, you've got your Sutars, your Burgess, your yada yada, Kai Rowles, all that. Sure thing, right? I'm fine with the centre-back selections, whatever. But why there's no Alessandro Cacciati in there? God knows. I didn't hear any news about him being injured at Parma, and he's going to be playing in Serie A next year. If it's a situation of them wanting to keep him around for their league fixtures, fair enough. Whatever. I commend the the selectors for at least taking the time out to make sure that he's getting playing time over there. Hey guys, Alex from the future here. I'm just popping into the video to tell you guys that the selectors not picking Alessandro Cacciati was because they were hoping that by not picking him for Socceroos fixtures and not capping him for the national team officially, that it would now allow Palmer to let him go for the Olympic Games, which, by all of these reports that we are currently receiving, we know is probably not going to be likely because Palmer probably won't release him anyway. So once again, we have shot ourselves on the foot, and I hate this organisation. But there's plenty of other young centre-backs that could be used in this kind of call-up here. Nectarios Triantis has been getting game time at Hibernian. I don't know why maybe he doesn't get a call-up or something like that. I don't know why plenty of these young A-League centre-backs aren't even being given call-ups, but that's besides the point, I guess. Well, let's just move on to this absolute just state of the rest of the team right now. Okay, now let's get along to the second best part of the selection after the goalkeepers, which is undoubtedly the midfield. Now, I don't really have too many complaints with this midfield. There's a few selections that I don't really understand per se, but let's just let's just crack onto it here. The two defensive mids that we brought along are Keanu Bacchus and Patrick Yazbek. Now, a lot of people have a problem with Yazbek's selection purely just because he hasn't been getting as much game time you know, he's not really maybe warranting a call-up for some people. Personally, I don't mind Yashbek's inclusion. I think he's a great midfielder. I think it's good that he's getting a chance to be around the squad. So I hope to see him get some minutes against Lebanon and prove those doubters wrong. Center mids, we've got Metcalf and Irvine. Once again, fine with this selection. You're not going to really have any better, especially since Luongo seemingly got forced to retire by Graham Arnold. And in terms of attacking midfielders, you have... Uh, Aiden Khustik making his return after one game for Heracles, and you also uh, have the mainstay of this midfield, that being Riley McGree after he just got off of scoring an absolute banger to win Middlesbrough their latest league game. But there's a problem here. Why haven't you selected someone like Callum Neuenhoff or Josh Nisbet, both of which are on incredible form right now? You look at guys like um, you look at guys like Yashbek who are being selected over someone like Neuenhoff. You look at the fact that Hustik, after playing one or two games in the Netherlands, after not playing for about a year and a half, is now being selected over the likes of Josh Nisbet, who's been undoubtedly one of the best midfielders in the A-League this season. I don't understand that decision-making. All right, guys, Alex from the future again. As I'm sure you've seen, Josh Nisbet is now part of the Socceroos uh, lineup or squad for the games against Lebanon. They did call him in, but only after injuries and spots opened up in the squad, allowing him to actually come into the squad. So glad to see that he's actually been calling up and he's getting his chance, but I'm disappointed that it took this long. It really shows a lack of initiative from the selectors, but glad he's going to get his chance. He's deserved it. He's been a great midfielder in the A-League for multiple years now, so good to see another homegrown talent getting right through to the national team. Alrighty, lads, I'll chuck it back to past Alex for the next bit. Look, do we have a good midfield? Yes. Do we have one of the be be one of the better midfields in Asia right now? I'd say yes. I'd say we're probably maybe top four or top five nations for midfields right now, which we should be, don't get me wrong. But it's good to see that our midfield's relatively solid. However, I don't know why we're not using this chance to experiment with some younger guys who deserve call-ups. I really don't understand that decision-making at all. So let's get on to the attackers, and I'll note what problems I have with this absolute shambles that we have in attack. So some of you may be wondering, Alex, what problems do you have with this attack? Well, where do I begin? Now, obviously, I noted that Martin Boyle and Marco Tilio are both out with injury right now, therefore can't get selected for the squad. Fair enough, right? My problem stems from the fact that our next choice at right wing is a striker. And what I mean by that is, why in the shit have we brought along Brandon Borello? All right? Look. If this was a year ago when he was firing on all cylinders in the A-League, sure, I would have brought along Borello. But since then, he's gotten injured, come back from injury, and he's done nothing. Wanderers fans will tell you that he's done nothing. 
Is he a good depth player? Sure, maybe for an A-League side, all right? Maybe he can warrant a start for an A-League side, but he's been starting up top. He's lost a lot of his pace. He's lost a lot of his ability to get that sort of quick, nippy movement that you need from a winger. I just don't understand what the strength is having him at right wing at this stage, all right? So that's that. In terms of other people who can probably play right wing or might play right wing in the system, you obviously have Connor Metcalf, but if that's the case, why not bring along Josh Nisbet or a Callum Neuenhoff to put as that extra man in the midfield, especially considering that we have nine attackers? As someone else who can maybe play off the left wing, I have no idea, uh, off the right wing, sorry. Maybe you chuck Cassini Yengi there. Maybe. He's had a couple of appearances there for Portsmouth. Didn't really impress, uh, for me at least, playing off that right wing. I think he's much better as a as a striker. He offers us a lot more from that position. And then there's the fact that we haven't called up Nestor Irinkunda. We haven't called up Garen Quoll. You know, none of these guys that have been playing relatively well for their club sides, I don't know why they're not getting call-ups. And... You know, it's really crazy to me how we're not taking this opportunity to get some of the younger guys in the soccer setup. It makes absolutely zero sense to anything that's going on right now or what should be going on with the squad selection. Now, the left wingers look a bit better. You have Craig Goodwin and you have Sammy Silvera. Now, they strike me as the two guys that are going to be our major left wingers going forward, which I'm completely fine with, all right? Craig Goodwin is going to be our starting left winger for another year or two at least. Silvera's not incredible, per se. I still think he has a lot that he needs to improve on with his productivity um, going forward. He's good at maintaining possession, but sometimes he just takes just stupid risks that he doesn't need to take. And it was very evident when he was playing in the Asian Cup that I don't think he was just suited to playing at that national team level yet. But he will get there. I'm glad that we're sticking by him and giving him another chance. My main problem with this entire squad comes from the fact that we have selected not one, two, three, not four, not five, Six. Six goddamn strikers in the squad. Now, let's just go through all of this really quickly. Obviously, you have Mitchell Duke, who's a mainstay in this Graham Arnold soccer setup. I've said it plenty of times that I don't think Duke should be our starting striker anymore. I don't think he should be taking up a spot in the squad anymore. He's obviously a bit older. He's past it. We've got a similar profile to him in Iredale. We've got someone with a bit of a better profile in Cassini Yangi. I don't understand bringing Duke along. Obviously, I just mentioned Cassini Yengi. He's in there as well. John Iredale. He's also in there. You have Bruno Fornaroli, who, you know, I love Bruno, all right? I'm a Bruno enthusiast. He hasn't been on great form for the victory since he came back from the Asian Cup. He's been all right, don't get me wrong. But I really thought this would have been the time to call up someone like a Mohamed Torre or to call up someone like a, uh, a Noah Bottic. Uh, sorry, not a Noah Bottic, he's injured. Like a Thomas Waddingham or even a Jovanovic or someone like that. Now, we obviously called up Barella as well. I expect him to play out off of that right wing. And thank the Lord, finally, we got a call up for Adam Taggart. Finally, I've been asking for it. He's been deserving for it for the last two to three years now. Finally, he gets his return. Why on earth, by the way, have we not called up Apostolos Stamatolopoulos, all right? He has been firing for the Jets this season. One of the worst sides of the A-League this season. And he has been carrying them carrying them off the bottom of that table. Yet, he's not given a shot at the national team, but Bruno Fornaroli is, but Brandon Borello is, and Mitch Duke keeps his starting spot. I don't understand that at all. Look, if your plan was to have Cassini Yengi as an option off of that right wing, sure, have your three strikers in that case be Iredale, Taggart, and Stamatolopoulos. You have Iredale as that big, tall Duke replacement that you put up there for some hold-up play, for some... Big old muscly striker movement, all right? Taggart is absolutely class when it comes to his positioning, his movement. He can score goals from inside the box tap ends, or he can score some absolute bangers as we see in the A-League this season. Stamatolopoulos, he's a nifty mover. He gets into positions all the time that a striker just needs to be in. You look at a lot of Stammer's goals compared to Taggart or someone like that, and you say, well, Stammer's goals aren't that impressive, but his movement is phenomenal. And he's only 24 years of age. He's only going to get better with uh, with experience. So the reason that we have called up Bruno, Borello, and Duke over giving Stamatolopoulos a chance, I just don't understand it in the slightest at all. So now, lads, let's get into the part of the video where I'm very excited about, where I get to sit and complain about things I don't like about the Socceroos for the next 15 to 20 minutes. The first of which is going to be the fact that we keep calling up old players.
Now, some of you lads might be wondering why exactly that's a bad thing. Of course, you want to bring experienced players to stuff like a tournament, and you want to make sure you're bringing your best players all the time. Now, I am completely happy with the fact that we decided to call up experienced players for the World Cup. I'm not too disappointed that we didn't see the likes of maybe, um, you know, Quoll or Irin Kunda, purely because you need to bring your absolute best squad. Now, do I think that Quoll and Irin Kunda could have made our best squad, considering some of the people that we did bring along? Absolutely. Um, but look... I'm not too fussed about it, in all honesty. We brought along a fine squad, got to the semi-final, should have gone further. We didn't because of some poor coaching, but uh, it's whatever. What I don't like now is that for games against Lebanon, which we arguably should be winning comfortably, especially for friendly games and for uh, other Asian Cup games where we should be capping young players that were at risk of losing... We are continuing to call up the same old players that don't have a future with this national team and that don't really offer anything. A prime example is in a one-striker formation, calling up three guys that we really don't need to be calling up being Brandon Borello, Mitch Duke, and Bruno Fornaroli. We really do not to be we really do not have to call up a 37-year-old Bruno, a 30-something Brandon Borello who's just come back from a really bad injury, and a Mitch Duke who was entirely ineffective for the majority of the Asian Cup. It's just not good enough in terms of our selection. It's lazy. It's just... It's cowardly. It's cowardly. No Mohamed Torre. No Thomas Waddingham. No Apostolos Stamatolopoulos after he's, what, the second, third top goal scorer in the A-League right now? Which is absolutely crazy to me. Al along with that as well, no Irin Kunda still. He has not yet made a competitive national team appearance. Garen Quoll has not got his call back yet when he could really benefit from the exposure. And before you say to me, oh, well, Garen Quoll hasn't been playing for Volendam. Why the... F why I'm not going to swear. Why did we call Marco Tilio when he was not getting game time at Celtic? We did it because we needed the exposure for him. And don't tell me, oh, but he was going to be a mainstay player in that. He got, what, five, ten minutes off of the bench in our group stage games? And we had... We were dying. We were dying for an undercover option there for Martin Boyle out on that right wing. We could have used Quoll perfectly in that spot, but no, we chose Tilio instead, and I still don't understand that at all. Another thing is, why are we not calling up to cap certain players that we really need to be capping? Alessandro Cacciati, Volpato I understand because there's a situation at Sassuolo, but Alex Robertson is another perfect example of a player that we need to cap. Mohamed Torre is also another example. These are players with alternate nationalities that we are at very high risk of losing if we do not call them up. Yet time after time after time, we are refusing to call up our future generation to get them capped for our national team for the next decade, decade and a half, purely because we want to be lazy, because we want to select easy options. And I don't understand it at all. Now, look, as I mentioned, you have the rare occasions where you have players that don't want to be called up purely because they're at risk of losing their spot for their club team. Christian Bolpart is a perfect example. We know this is very widely documented that he wants to play for the Socceroos. There's been a large indication that he does want to play for Australia. However, since he's at Sassuolo, they don't want him to go out because he's a young guy. He's getting involved with the team. He's finally starting to get minutes. They don't want to release him for an international competition which is fine. And some people will have a cry saying, oh, but Alex, he just got selected for the under-21s Italy squad. It obviously means he doesn't want to play for Australia. Ah, uh, no. It's because he's going to be much closer to home. He's going to have involvement with the youth setup that Sassuolo know very well, considering that they release a lot of their younger players to these youth team setups. And more importantly, Italian clubs love when they have their own youth players go out to these Italian teams. They don't like releasing players out to other national teams. It is well documented. And another case is with Alessandro Cacciati, but this case is completely different. Alessandro Cacciati, as we saw from the report earlier, and uh, just wasn't released purely because Parma said we don't want him to go. And Sakharu's thought, oh, well, if we don't release him now, surely Parma will release him for the Olympics. And guess what? Parma have no obligation to release him for the Olympics, and it's crunch time in their season. I am guaranteeing you he's not going to get released for the Olympics. I guarantee it. I'm about 99% sure on this point. And the fact that we're not calling up guys like Kachati to our um, to our youth qualifiers to even get into the Olympics, putting us at risk of not even qualifying, is absolutely stupid.
It's absolutely stupid. We are bending over backwards for a Setia B team when we should be capping these guys at international level. Another one is Irin Kunda. Irin Kunda evid uh, is evidently um, able to play for Burundi or play for Tanzania. Now, I don't think he'll go for either Tanzania or Burundi because he will make the Australian national team eventually. But why he hasn't been called up yet is absolutely astonishing to me. I have no idea why. And the one that pisses me off the most is Alex Robertson. Alex Robertson is easily one of the best Australian talents I have seen in probably since the golden generation of 2006 to the early 2010s. I have not seen a more composed, mature Australian midfielder on the ball, off the ball with his movement and everything of the sort since Alex Robertson. It is just astonishing how we are consistently consistently shagging this man and not giving him an international call-up in a competitive game. It is absolutely disgraceful. And look, obviously there was that big scare around the Asian Cup when he uh, deleted all the Socceroos content and whatever. From what I've been told and from what we've heard from Arnie, apparently this is a big nothing. And lots of people in the media were like, oh, you people need to stop reading into everything you see on social media. Uh, no. We have a right to be worried when at one of our best young prospects, if not our best young prospect, is deleting all of our national team content off of social media and then liking uh, Instagram comments from his Peruvian teammates telling him to come play for the Peruvian national team. It's not a good look. It's not a good look at all. Maybe is this a bit of a petty play from Alex Robertson because he wants a call-up? Maybe, but he deserves a call-up. Why the hell is he not getting a call-up, but guys like, I don't even know. Guys like Patrick Yashvick are getting a call-up at this point. Aiden Hustick is getting a call-up after not playing for nearly two years. Why are we not calling up Alex Robertson? Yes, I know he's injured, so it's a different situation, but he should have been called up at the Asian Cup, and the fact that he wasn't is absolutely disgraceful. I will not accept that still, and I will hold that with me as a grudge until he is called up to the national team. The final point I'm going to speak on for squad selection and why it's wrong is just the squad selections make no sense. Four right backs, one left back, zero right wingers, and six strikers in a one striker formation. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, oh man, it just makes no sense. I just... I don't want to speak on it because it's Graham Arnold. He's never been the smartest bloke and all the people in the media, all his friends in the media like Robbie Slater who like to you know, kiss his ass at every turn when he makes horrific decisions in terms of coaching and selections and everything. I have no words for them to describe them either. So I'm just going to move on from squad selections because it's starting to hurt my head now. Now, alongside the fact that I think we don't trust our youngsters and we make very poor decisions when calling up players and we're not smart in the way that we do call up players with, you know, eligible nationalities outside of Australia. Another problem that I think we have is obviously one that I've been wanting to point out for this whole video, and I'm finally going to point it out now, Graham Arnold. Now, Arnie has divided a lot of opinions, especially since the World Cup campaign. Now, look, before the World Cup, people wanted Arnie gone. World Cup, we had a good showing, and we decided to keep him on afterwards, and a lot of people's opinion on Arnie changed. However, I'm proud to say I'm one of the people that did not change their opinion, and here's why. I prefer to do my judgment of a coach or of a team or of a player based on what I see in a game rather than what I see on a scoreboard or a ladder or, you know, with stuff to that degree, with statistics, basically. I don't like to judge teams like that. I don't judge managers like that. I don't judge players like that. That's why one of my favorite wingers, for example, would be Jack Grealish. He's not the most statistically pleasing to, uh, player to look at, but when you watch him in an actual game, he's absolutely phenomenal. For that exact same reason, I think Graham Arnold is a horrible coach for the national team and he needs to be gone immediately. And you might say, Alex, you got us to the round of 16 in the World Cup. We got a win against Denmark, got a win against Tunisia. We did well against Argentina and we were momentarily doing good against France. That's true. But it's what happened after the Asian Cup, which really annoys me. Now, you can look at that and say, well, we had some, you know, good friendlies. We had some good results against... Uh, Mexico and Ecuador, I'd say, yes, that's true. We had some good games against Mexico and we had good games against Ecuador. Perfect. However, I don't want to count friendly games as an indication of whether or not a manager is worthy of their job. And I'll tell you why. Because it's a friendly game. It means nothing. Teams play out shit people. They call up people that don't normally get call-ups for the sake of it. Like, for fuck's sake, we had Jason Cummings getting called up to the Socceroos squad. 
we had Le- we had Andrew Redmayne starting games in friendlies against New Zealand. He Andrew Redmayne is shit. I'm sorry, he's shit. He's a shit goalkeeper in terms of national team quality that we have right now. I could probably pick you out six or seven people that I'd rather have in the national team over Andrew Redmayne. So that's just sure. You can look at it and say, well, we got a good result. We got a win against Ecuador. That's nice. Well, yeah, it is nice. But it's a friendly game, so I don't want to read too much into that. One of my main problems with Graham Arnold is how outdated his style of football is. Now, I've talked so much about what I hate, hate, hate about this 4-1-4-1 system that Graham Arnold plays and how much it just kills my brain to have to watch us play football like that. Especially when you try to implement people like Sammy Silvera into this system. It just doesn't work. I'm sorry, a winger in this sort of side needs to be able to hug the touchline, and we just don't have people like that in the national team. And Graham Arnold needs to have a long, hard look at the style of coaching that he's implementing and realise, hey, we don't have wingers on the left wing apart from Craig Goodwin that can pace down the line, and Craig Goodwin doesn't even have pace. His solution, well, instead of, you know, maybe changing up the system to accommodate for the fact that we can have an inside winger off the left, I don't know, let's play a left back at left wing. Why not? Let's play Geordie Boss, our best left back by far, at left wing. And what was the result? Well, it wasn't horrible. Let me be honest, it wasn't actually that horrible. Geordie Boss did score during the Asian Cup. What did he do after that at left wing? Absolutely nothing. He did absolutely jack all. He was terrible. And look, I love Geordie Boss. He's a phenomenal player. But a big strength of his is the fact that he can come in from left back, make a good run up high, and then be able to tuck in and be an extra man in the midfield because he's good on his right foot and he's good cutting inside to the inside of the pitch. And we lose that aspect when you play someone like Geordie Boss at left wing. Now, obviously, a game where Craig Goodwin is playing, sure, use the 4-1-4-1. But why the hell are you using inside wingers in a situation where they won't have space to cut inside because there's so many people already there? Graham, please, just stop. Just stop with it. My God. Not to mention, I don't think Graham Arnold knows what the hell he wants out of a striker. The fact that he keeps playing Mitch Duke makes me think, okay, maybe he wants a big, tall, hold-up play man. Cool. But then why the hell would you bring to an Asian Cup? <laughs> why Why would you bring to an Asian Cup Ayerdale when you don't intend to play him? When he's f- more physically impressive than Mitch Duke and he's younger and he fits pretty much the exact same profile. Cassini Yenge, he's so much better in terms of profile, but still he goes with Mitch Duke, and I just don't, I just don't understand why. I really don't. I could go on for on and on for hours, for about an, just for hours, for multiple hours, about things that I don't like about Graham Arnold and his coaching style and why I think he needs to leave the national team. But evidently we're going to have him going forward, and we're probably going to have him until the World Cup, which, yippee, that's great. Let's completely ignore the fact that we nearly lost games against uh, against Syria in the Asian Cup because of his terrible coaching. We barely beat India because of his terrible coaching. Uh, let's ignore the fact that we should have beaten South Korea but didn't because of his terrible coaching. And the fact that the only game where we really looked convincing in the entirety of the Asian Cup was against Indonesia. So let's ignore all of that and let's just keep throwing our faith behind Graham Arnold. Good old Graham Arnold with his Aussie passion and true blue Aussie spirit that's going to win us every title known to mankind because fuck tactics, fuck football, you all know nothing. Graham Arnold and his passion ball is great and I love it so fuck. Now let's move on to the final part of this video which is obviously what do I think we can do from here. Now there's heaps of things that need to happen with Australian football. Obviously I can go into a rant that goes down to stuff like the A-League and grassroots soccer but I'm going to look more to the immediate effect with the national team. So my first scenario, sack Graham Arnold. 100% you sack Arnie. You look to get in a new national team coach. Now, obviously, we had people that were available not too long ago. You had the likes of Marcelo Bielsa, who we ended up, you know, not going in for because we wanted Arnie instead. I don't know why. Look, here's the situation. Do you want to go with a foreign coach or do you want to go with an Australian? Personally, I'd go with a foreign coach, a European coach, or a South American coach, whoever, who can come in, weather the storm, is experienced in these kinds of scenarios working with national teams and can really just instill proper football into this national team side. But Bielsa would have been the absolute perfect candidate for that role, but obviously he's with the Uruguay national team now, so we can't get him. If you do go Aussie, there's only a few names that I chuck up. Some people are saying Kisnorbo. I personally wouldn't. He had a bad spell at Trois, and I think he really needs to get back 
into the sort of swing of things, coaching at a at a club level. Uh, Rudan is about to leave the Wanderers. I wouldn't take Rudan personally. I I just don't think I would. The Australian coach that I probably would take, apart from Kevin Musket, I would have loved to have seen Musket in the national team setup, but he's not going to uh, evidently now that he's in China. The coach that I would take if I had to pick any Australian would be Tony Popovich. Now, I know some people won't like that decision, but you've got to look at it this way. What Australian coaches can we honestly say now? And I would have said Nick Montgomery as well. He's looking good at Hibernian though, and I think he can take a serious role at a club right now. Tony Popovich, in terms of his managerial st- uh, career, has hit a bit of a standstill, right? And I feel like an international job is sort of a job you have to extend to a manager who's at a standstill. Like, you look at when Bielsa took the Uruguay job. He did it after getting sacked from Leeds. You, you take any manager who takes a national team job, they do it after, you know, their career sort of stunts a bit. And I feel like, in this case, if you are going to pick an Australian, I think the best one, maybe not the best one available, but the one that sort of makes the most sense is Tony Popovich. And look, he's had various levels of success. He's won the A-League with the glory. He's had a good spell with the victory. Now they're sort of starting to drop off here and there. I think now would be a good time to get him in the national team setup, especially since I think the victory will be looking forward and looking to replace him with a different coach. I think now could be a good opportunity to get him in. The next thing I think we need to be doing is 100% we need to call up our young players. Now, you can say, Alex, who are you going to call up in particular? Well, there's the obvious cases. You need a young striker for the future, maybe one who's a bit taller, physically imposing. Cool. Thomas Waddingham, Mohamed Toure. John Idale's already been called up, but he's yet to actually play any minutes. So John Idale, you get him here, you get some minutes into him as well. And a Pasolos, Stamatolopoulos, you get him in and you get him some minutes as well. In terms of, you know, any young wingers on the market, you get Garen Quall back into the lineup. Uh, you get Iren Kunda, you get him capped, most importantly. Same with Mohamed Torre. I don't want to go on and playing for Mali. And Mali's a bit more impressive than Tanzania. So maybe he would go. So maybe you do. Maybe you should cap him before he does make that decision. Young midfielders. You got Alex Robertson. Patrick Yazbek's already in the team, but he hasn't made an appearance yet. So get him some competitive minutes. There's plenty of others as well. Josh Nisbet. Get him some competitive minutes. Um, just quite literally anyone. Ryan Teague. I'd love to see Ryan Teague get a call up. You know... Defenders, man. There's so many. Nectarius Triantis, he's one. In terms of fullback, Moragas, Farrell, they could all get call-ups as well. I know Boss is sort of killing that left-back role at the moment, but, you know, Aziz Bayic has got an, has got an injury. So, you know, if Bayic has an injury, why would you not do that? Why would you not call up these youngsters that are warranting for a call-up because of their performances in the A-League? It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, really. But... Those are the main things that I would sort of do currently within the national team setup to sort of weather the storm a bit and provide a bit more clarity. You need to get in a style of coach who can play an attacking brand of football that fits the young players that we are producing because most of our best young players are either coming through the A-League where it's becoming progressively more and more an attacking-minded league. And you can see that with lots of the games that are finishing 5-0, 6-0, 7-0, those kinds of games, games that are ending in 3-3, 4-3, stuff like that. It's becoming a very, like, fun league to watch because of the attacking style that a lot of these modern coaches are adapting. And I really like that it's becoming that, but it's not showing with our national team setup at all because it's the most dead, boring, just uninspiring football you've ever seen. And that needs to change because we're bringing through a generation of footballers who are very talented, a lot of which are going to be playing at top levels in Europe, And we can't have them stuck playing this football. We really can't because it's an absolute embarrassment to the nation and to these players as well. So guys, that's going to be it for my rant for now. Um, I've had to split this video up. So if any more information has come out now, I'll put myself in a random interval at some point in the video to explain things a bit further. But it's just frustrating, man. Like just the state of the national team right now, the potential that this side has going forward just to see that it's possibly being squandered by not just one man who doesn't understand, you know, anything about what we should be producing at this level, but just a whole group of people surrounding the Socceroos and the FA that just don't know what this country truly needs in terms of football. And hey, you can type in the comments and say I'm a dickhead and I don't know what I'm saying because I'm just a kid sitting in his bedroom making YouTube videos because I dislike, you know, the direction the national team is going. 
But you're more entitled to do that. I don't care. I have my opinions and I feel fr I'm free to voice my opinions on, on YouTube if I want to. And you're free to voice yours. So let me know in the comments below if you think I'm a knobhead who knows nothing. Or let me know in the comments if you think I'm right and if I've missed out on anything that we should be improving at the national team level. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching the video. Thank you guys so much for your support on the channel recently. We're nearly at 300 subscribers, so make sure you like and subscribe. Help us get over the line there. And uh, yeah, lads, it's been an absolute pleasure ranting to you. I hope, I hope, I hope we get two wins against Lebanon. But until I catch you guys in the next video, take care. I'll catch you later.